ANC launches a new campaign today aimed at educating and empowering voters. Here on Head Start, we'll be getting to know the senatorial aspirants seeking to win your votes on May 9. And first on the series, we have Dr. Carl Balita running under Action Democratico Party. Dr. Carl Balita, good morning to you. Good morning and happy birthday, Karen. Belated happy birthday. All right. Thank you so much. Actually, it came as a surprise to many that you suddenly wanted to seek a Senate seat. You've been in broadcasting for so long, a health advocate, an educator. Yes, you have had experience in um, local organizations in Quezon City, but why a Senate seat? Yeah, this is in response to the uh, request of the sectors that I represent, Karen. Uh, the health sector, because I'm a health professional, I, uh, the, hus- the doctors, the hospital leaders, uh, the nurses, and the midwives, etc., uh, thought that uh, my diversity of exposure in other sectors could make me a winnable candidate to represent health. Of course, I'm uh, the only midwife and the first nurse midwife running in the Senate and uh, the MSME sector as well. I'm the, probably the only MSME running and the education sector as well through the Educational Task Force of the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, thought that uh, someone who would have a a diverse orientation and exposure for 20 years in broadcasting would probably represent also the the education sector. That's why, Karen, I stand for uh, kalusugan, karunungan, and uh, kabuhayan because these are the three sectors that were hard hit by the pandemic, and that made me decide to run. Okay, but take us through the process first Mm -hmm. of... um, but how you actually joined uh, Manila Mayor Isko Moreno's Action Democratico? Yeah, initially I refused. I rejected the offers and the request of the health group to bring me into the Senate race. And, uh, you know, Isko Moreno is someone I have known since he was vice president of the Philippines when uh, we were helping some children with biliary atresia. That's where it all started. And I have known him because my uh, headquarters uh, is based in Manila. And uh, Dr. Willie Ong is one, was uh, one candidate I supported in the 2019 election. And then uh, they had partnered together and they came to be two people who knew me uh, and uh, both called me and invited me. And uh, the, the biggest challenge, Karen, was to convince my family and uh, especially my children who thought initially that they, they threatened me initially that they'll migrate if ever I'll make a decision to run. But, you know, mm-hmm. I convinced them enough. And uh, the rest is history, Karen. This was a difficult sacrifice as well. I have to give up a 20-year-old show in uh, Teleradio for this. You know that, it, how, how it means to me. And, um, you know, but, but I'm giving it a chance uh, as the only nurse, teacher, midwife, MSME running in the Senate uh, at the very least. Okay. You talked about several sectors asking you to run. Mm-hmm. Have you actually done the math on the chances of you winning if members of this sector supported you? Well, I, Karen, uh, my uh, 14-year-old review center must have been a bridge to some uh, a million professionals already. Just imagine the, you know, the exponential effect of that. The 20 years in DZMM in Teleradio may have exposed me to a significant number that could bring me on. But uh, what I believe in is really is my chance to communicate my platform and my technocrat appeal to the general public uh, so that they would see that uh, if they really want someone new in the Senate, it could just be, you know, this professional, this rare professional who will have the courage to run. Mm-mm. But what can you bring into the Senate that other um, the health advocates who are actually in the Senate are not able to do? The biggest sector in health, Karen, are the nurses and the midwives, the BHW. And, uh, you know, they are the frontliners, in fact. Uh, as a professional, that's what I bring in. So I speak the language of this sector, of these sectors, the three sectors I was talking about. And I'm not only bringing myself, I'm actually bringing the sector through the network that I have built with them. Uh, mm-hmm. Like with the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm part of the national committees of that, the Philippine Franchise Association and other organizations, just not local 
uh, chamber movement that I'm bringing, but in the entire business sector that that I'm bringing in. So I think it's it's my the language that I speak with the network that I represent that would put value to what is relevant, especially that they the three sectors are most hit, hardly hit by this pandemic, including uh, the educational sector, Karen. Okay, no, but you need to be specific. I understand. Yeah. Technically, right now, you're bringing up your affiliations, but then what can you do that other senators aren't doing as of now? Well, it's, it's really hearing it out from the sector, Karen. So it's, be specific. Uh, what is it? What aren't they doing? For example, did you know, for example, the teachers are, the Filipino teachers are the lowest paid teachers in, in the country. And the, 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 the domestic helpers in Hong Kong are probably getting higher salaries than teachers. Then how do we attract the best and the brightest? And for the longest time, we have known this. The performance of our students... But is that still accurate? I'm curious because right yes. now, I mean... There have been an increase. Of course, our teachers need higher salaries, but you have an entry level now that's hitting at least, I think, more than 30,000. It's, it's uh, uh, around the 27,000 okay. current salary grade 11 for the entry teacher. And uh, that's not even comparable apples to apples with other teachers, at least in the ASEAN. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's that's sad, Karen, because uh, the uh, the uniform personnel appropriately are getting higher salary. The nurses are getting thirty seven thousand um, uh, sa- a salary, but those in private are the ones suffering, Karen. Oh. So you know. But is this coming from your expertise? In other words, that's a skill set that any other legislator will be able to read into. Yes, Karen, because there's always that wisdom of the law that legislators create. And that's where I'm coming from. I think the reason why uh, these sectors had been for the longest time complaining over their, uh, you know, what they're getting is because they are not well represented enough as they are and as who they are. In this, in, in this with the chance that I'm bringing the Senate, uh, I, I speak their language, Karen. I've been with them. You know, I, I'm a nurse. I was... I was there. I'm a teacher. I was there. I'm bridged to many teachers, and I know exactly what's happening on the ground. So if you are given an opportunity, what amendment would you make? Or what would be the first law you would like to author? I'd like to propose for the EDCOM, Karen, the Educational Commission that happened first in 1990, because there are four reasons for it. Number one, we reviewed the the gains of the EDCOM. Number two, the Industry 4.0 that affected education, the pandemic situation, and the evaluation of the K-12, so that we can create a more comprehensive approach to whatever we want to do next. Mm-hmm. I also want to address the malnutrition of children. One-third of our children, Karen, are malnourished. And this will also create the local uh, demand for agricultural products to supply to them because you cannot teach a child who is hungry, and, and that's for a fact. Uh, with regards to the nurses, for example, and other health professionals, uh, we have to look into their positive practice environments, Karen, because we cannot match the tempting salary offers of overseas. And uh, we have to increase our supply of our healthcare professionals through some strategic directions and scholarships, Karen. And the number one, of course, the big one of the biggest loss passed every year is the budget. And we have to really prioritize these sectors if we really want to get out of this pandemic. Okay. And uh, you believe being um, in the Senate is the solution to everything you've mentioned, considering a lot of what you've just stated are actually um, policy actions from agencies. Yes, Karen, because uh, just like anything, as we face the new normal, we have to pivot. And uh, in pivot, it's important to become grounded. And even the laws will have to be reviewed if they will still be relevant for the new normal or the better normal that we're looking at in the post-pandemic times. If we are blinded of the realities of the ground, especially of those in the front line of the crisis, then we may just have uh, difficulty adapting to the new or to even to the better normal much more. Okay, so practically speaking, let's talk about um, nurses, your students uh, that you've said now graduated. What are you seeing in terms of the health sector voting for you? Let's talk about the numbers. Oh, the the, the numbers, Karen. Um, There are, you know, the nurses and the midwives are the biggest healthcare professionals. I'm probably one of the very few who's running with a professional license. You can just imagine the, you know, the clamor of the health professionals to, 
uh, to have someone who belong to wh- where they're coming from. Karen, for example, just very concretely, the, the salary of nurses, the salary grade 15 of the nurses took two decades to be implemented, even if it was a law of tw- almost 20 years ago. And this is not unique of nurses. This is very true with the other professionals as well. The private sector had been left out. You know, the competition uh, that was not necessary between schools and the, uh, the public and the private schools, for example, Karen, uh, has left many of the pri- private school teachers behind in terms of salaries and benefits. And this has to be looked into if we really want investment on our people and in the healthcare, because these two come together, Karen. They're basic human needs and basic to development, education and health. And uh, the, the sector that where I'm coming from need to be heard directly. No, I know that. But what I'm asking is, okay, I'll be specific. Dr. Willie Ong, when he last ran, he -hmm. was a neophyte candidate and he was coming from left field. Mm -hmm. He got something like 8 million votes, which Mm -hmm. actually surprised many people because that was a good showing considering what he had was essentially a Facebook audience, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So have you done the calculation? To win a Senate seat, you would need at least 13 or 14 million votes. Yes. With now 65 million voters, you probably need more. Yeah. Yeah, I did the math, Karen. I did the math. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I have 100... Where are you getting I, your voters? I have 120 branches operationally all over the country, Karen. I filled up practically all the biggest venues in all of these cities and uh, areas in the country where I operate, 120 at that. Uh, well, um, my, my, my products are all over the country. There are sometimes, and most of them are already in the areas of influence. Some of them in, in the business sector could probably be employers already. The others are in the professional field and their practice. Uh, given the math, like the Philippine arena, I filled up twice, Karen. Uh, the, the multiplier effect of those people whom I have touched lives and whom I have bridged to being professionals are probably out there upon knowing that I'm running, uh, will not only vote for me, but will even campaign for me within their circles. I, I, I've done my math, Karen. Plus, thank you for this opportunity. I know how much this is reaching. And 20 years of DZMM is no joke, Karen. Uh, it's yeah, probably yeah, something yeah. that I have been... I mean, people know me, and the only reason that they would vote for me is to read through my platform and hear about what I can do for them. Okay, and do you believe you're able to actually convert these based, into actual votes? Based on our initial survey, I'm uh, I'm a man of science and data, Karen. Uh, we need our initial uh, research among these people within and outside the circle. And even, Karen, 14 days after I filed my certificate of candidacy, I ranked number 29 already. That's on the 14th day. That was surprising to me because I'm no political brand. You know, I may be a brand in business or in education and in healthcare, but not in politics. But it was a surprising revelation that I ranked 29th in the survey 14 days after I filed. Okay, you ranked 29th, but ABS-CBN doesn't have the same reach as it used to. And you said in a previous interview that um, you will not be spending your own money because your money belongs to your family. So what kind of um, advertising will you be doing? What's the campaign strategy? Mm. I, I'm, of course, through the branches that I have established, Karen, through my network. But I'm very glad that uh, my presidential, Bolisco Moreno, loves going to the ground. We like have two or three sorties uh, weekly, and we're hitting the ground and the sector that probably wouldn't know me much. And this is an advantage, Karen. And this is the best support that I'm getting from my party and from, from the slate. And uh, we're going around. And uh, I am masipag ako, Karen. I go around people introducing myself and my friends are doing the same thing because if the professional group really want a professional and a technocrat in the Senate, then they'll help me. I know they'll help me. Okay. But technocrat would be, I would have to say, it would be too high a word Mm -mm. for a regular voter. It's such a vague concept to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, clearly health is your advocacy. Yes. So if a Carl Balita becomes a senator, what difference would that make to the universal health care law, for example? Yeah. What gaps would be filled? The gap is, uh, you know, to connect the dots of it, Karen. It's a beautiful concept, the universal health law. But, you know, if you have seen uh, the position paper, for example, of the Philippine Hospital Association and the private hospital association of the Philippines, uh, who, I mean, whose leaders were those who pushed me into this, Karen, 
uh, there have so many uh, issues regarding the universal health law. And, you know, the, the person in me could bridge that with government because, you know, cooperation is vital uh, in this context. The promotive and the preventive aspect of healthcare is nursing, Karen. It's very nursing, and that resonates with me as a nurse and as a midwife. Uh, the oversight function of uh, the Senate for the universal health law uh, will be tangible for me because I understand the language of health. And the, the yeah. promotive and preventive care and related to health, to healthy lifestyle would also carry the mental health, mm. which happens to be... simplify it, Carl. Oh, sure. You need to simplify this. Yes. Okay, what is it? Ano ba yun? Pagdating mo ah. ba sa Senado, magdadagdag ka ba ng pondo? Ano yeah. bang area sa universal health care law ang kulang? Yeah, ang kulang doon, Karen, is the opportunity ng private sector to participate in it because it's the task of the government to convince them, to have a buy-in. At for now, hindi maganda yan. And we have to really bridge it so that there would be more representation of the private sector because they are vital. Let's go specific in mental health, for example, which happens to be my specialty in nursing. You know for a fact that this is something that used to be stigmatized and discriminated. And we, we are, even if there is a law, it's not yet something that would operationalize it for the benefit of those who, uh, who, who suffered it during the pandemic. Very concrete. All right. Okay. With the 2022 budget, let's start with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget of failed health is at 79 billion pesos. Sapat ba ito para sa yo? Sapat if they will not have the, uh, you know, the issues that confronted their operations in the past, Karen. Uh, that's in the, I, I joined the hospital groups. In, in, in echoing, you know, that PhilHealth will have to be more an enabler rather than just an, a regulator of, uh, of those private hospitals. Because the private hospitals, Karen, want to participate with everything we do. But they have to be enabled rather than just regulated. So and if you were a senator, would you add budget to PhilHealth? Definitely, definitely, Karen, so that they can support the private uh, hospitals and so that they can pay them on time. And uh, it, what is good for the hospitals and the healthcare current will be good for the patients. What's detrimental will be detrimental as well. So uh, budget will always be an issue. Okay, so let's talk about formally. You have seen the Senate hearings on formally. For you, questionable ba ang paglipat ng pondo ng DOH sa uh, PSDBM at ang pagbibili? I'm sure you've seen the Senate hearings what do you find most questionable or alarming with the formally hearings? Well, it's, uh, I, I found that it's really the process, Karen. As it always, it's the process. It's, it's always the integrity that should have been prote protected, especially by PhilHealth, whose money is taken from the contribution of the workers. Transparency and the integrity, they have to recover their integrity, uh, Karen, especially in the, in the light of the uni universal health law. Okay, no. But um, when we're talking about formally, mm. walang pondo naman ang field health dun eh. That yeah. was 45 billion pesos. I'm sorry. Uh, in mm. terms of, that was the budget that was set aside actually for COVID mm. expenses. So mm. ang tanong ko sa iyo, ano ang pinaka nakaka-alarma sa buong hearing ng formally para sa iyo? Well, it's, it's, it's really the corruption issue, Karen, and uh, the misprioritized budget that would have been more beneficial for something else. Like, for example, that amount of money could have helped more health workers, uh, more health workers to be, in, uh, uh, to, to be given the, the, the allowances so that we could have attracted more health workers in, in the front line. Uh, sayang lang yung, it, I think it's a misprioritization of the funds that went elsewhere rather than what would have been more beneficial para sa tao. Oh, is it misprioritization or do you believe may mga kumita? Yeah, actually yun, yun, yun ang issue and uh, that's under investigation. And But you know, there's a public already, you know, in, in our eyes, as we listen to the investigation, there seems to be uh, something like that, Karen. But we're yet to see the finalization of all of this. And I'm, I'm, I, I will be very frustrated, really, if uh, ganon yung nangyari, Karen. Uh, in behalf of the health professionals who somehow were not happy on how they were supported and uh, protected during the peak of the pandemic. How would you describe the performance of Health Secretary Francisco Duque? 
Well, I joined the, uh, especially the doctors, remember in the beginning, they were even clamored for him to resign. Uh, he may have done his best, but uh, uh, his best may have been good enough if there would be, if there would have been more health professionals uh, in, in, for example, in, in the circle of uh, the, uh, operated us in the pandemic, Karen. So are you saying he should resign today? Well, he did not resign when everybody called for. I don't think my call would be necessary, but even the Senate asked the same thing. Uh, well, um, he would probably not do it now because bumaba na yung cases, especially that the call for his resignation was there when it was at his peak. How could the government have improved its COVID response? Taking care of the people who care, Karen. Kung tinulungan ng gobyerno yung mga nag-aalaga, kung inalagaan natin ang mga nag-aalaga, wala sanang masyadong maraming gustong umalis. No? The, the nurses would love to stay. I'm sure of that. We, even if we cannot match the salary that they get, they're getting uh, from overseas. Pero we should have given them more reason to stay. You okay. know, the sacrifices, yeah. Yeah. So, so but, senators had already set aside support and financial support for um, frontliners in Bayanihan 1 and 2. Yeah. And you remember there was late releases on this. Yes. So how would you, being a senator, make a difference when clearly the problem is executive in nature? Well, we cannot underestimate the power of the senators to to call the attention of these people who are supposed to be ex- to, to execute uh, these policies, Karen. You know, it's not only the SRA that was late, uh, the MAT, the um, Mill uh, Accommodation and Transportation Alliance also came yeah. late. Oh, yeah. Executive issue, because mm. there is money. Yeah, Karen, but if a senator cannot, uh, especially who represent the sector, cannot, uh, you know, echo that out to, to the executive, mm. then who can? And, and are, are you saying they haven't echoed it out? Not much, because, you know, the, it's, it's, the end, it's the end that could talk about it, Karen. Uh, maram, ang dami pa rin issue niyan. It's not only the delayed the releases, Karen. Uh, maraming issues. And uh, this is just at the tip of the iceberg. And nurses are living, Karen, by the way. If not for the deployment ban of 6,500 for 2021, there would have been more nurses living. And uh, until we realized that they are gone because we did not take care of them well. Okay, so if you are a senator, what kind of law would you craft to ensure that nurses won't leave? More, more scholarship in the budget, Karen, is, is especially. Uh, in fact, I, would, I want to pa- reach out to those who have dropped out from nursing, for example, specifically, uh, because it will be shorter that they will become nurses. We have to make those who did not pass the board pass the board, and those who have left nursing to be bridged back to nursing competencies, because there are many who are in the call centers and in other areas. It's really about budget that would provide for more supply Mm-hmm. And scholarship for those senior high school who may want to go to nursing. And lifting of the moratorium on the nursing schools opening. Okay. Now, the, um, Dr. Carl Balita, considering that you are an advocate of a specific group, mm-hmm. some people may ask you, shouldn't if you have joined a party list group that actually advocated for a specific uh, sector? Yeah, there is. There is. There are current. In fact, I've partnered with them. In fact, from here, we'll be going to Comelec because there is, an, there is a rumor that the only nursing party list will not be allowed to run. And that's why we want to go to Comelec and appeal. Yeah, there are, uh, we're, we're doing why it Why didn't ways. you run for a party list group? Because I would rather support them from the upper house, Karen. And I'm taking my chances with with the other sectors that I represent because the num- you're right. The numbers from the health sector will not be enough. Incidentally, I'm not only coming from that sector, I'm also coming from elsewhere. Mm. Okay, before we go, what do you believe is the biggest achievement of the Duterte administration and its biggest failure? The build, 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 Karen. Um, the build, 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 uh, even uh, Isko Moreno would like to continue it, but this time focus on shelter, on hospitals and schools. Um, that, that's the biggest gain. On, on to failure, I don't want to call it failure, but uh, improvements. Uh, you know, we're, we're a, a very young democracy. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really corruption, still corruption that has to be, uh, you know, it, because it's not only for the president to, to actually achieve, but for the entire society to achieve. 
All right. On that note, Dr. Carl Balita, good luck to you and thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Karen.